all the different types of physical or chemical processes and reactions that exist in nature must obey the laws of thermodynamics. And that means any type of biological reaction that you're going to come across in your study of biochemistry must obey these laws. So in this lecture we're going to focus on the first and second law of thermodynamics because in the study of biochemistry these laws essentially dictate the conditions under which a certain biological reaction is favorable and the conditions under which that same reaction is not favorable. So we have to take into consideration these two laws in essentially every biological process that takes place. So let's begin with the first law of thermodynamics. So <clears throat> recall that any region of space that contains the atoms or molecules that we're studying, that is our system. And all the molecules and atoms found outside the system, that is our surroundings. Now what that means is, if we take the sum of the molecules of our system and all the molecules in our surroundings, that will give us the molecules in our universe. Now, what the first law of thermodynamics tells us is, if we sum up the energy of our system and the energy of our surroundings, that is always equal to the energy of the universe and the energy of the universe is always a constant value. So it never decreases, it never increases, it always remains the same, it remains constant. And what that means is, Energy is never destroyed, energy is never created, but energy can be transformed from one form to another. And this is true for physical as well as chemical reactions. So what we mean is, let's, let's suppose the following physical reaction. So here we have an object, our marker, and the marker has a certain amount of potential energy as a result of its position with respect to the ground. So remember, the Earth exerts a gravitational force and that gives it a certain amount of gravitational potential energy. Now, as soon as I let go of my marker, the marker will begin to travel downward. And so as the marker travels, its gravitational potential energy will begin to decrease. The question is, where does that gravitational potential energy actually go? Well, that energy cannot be destroyed by the first law of thermodynamics. And what happens to it is that gravitational potential energy begins to transform into the energy of motion of that object known as the kinetic energy. So as the marker travels down, that potential energy is being transformed into kinetic energy. And the same exact is true, the same thing is true for chemical and biological reactions. Energy is never destroyed, energy is never created, but energy is readily transformed from one form to another. And if we take the sum of the energy of the system and the surroundings, it is always equal to a constant value, the energy of our universe, and that never actually changes. Now, what about the second law of thermodynamics? Well, the second law of thermodynamics is commonly described by using a term known as entropy. And entropy is this quantity that we use to basically measure the amount of randomness or disorder that is found in our universe. Now, what exactly does the second law of thermodynamics tell us? Well, what it tells us is, Every time a real reaction takes place, be it physical or chemical, the change in entropy of the universe is always positive. So the entropy of the universe increases in any real reaction. So the second law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of the universe always increases. Now, that doesn't mean that the change in entropy of a system cannot be negative. So, the entropy of a system can still decrease as long as the entropy of the surroundings increases by a greater amount. So that, this is always true. So, the entropy of a system can decrease, can be negative, as long as the entropy of the surroundings is increased by a greater amount, so that when we take the sum, we see that the change in entropy of the universe 
is always equal to a positive value. It is never equal to a negative value. Now, the next question is, what exactly do we mean by entropy? Well, let's look at diagram A and diagram B. In diagram A, we have a situation in which this container is our system and the molecules inside are also part of our system. Now, in this particular case, we have this artificial barrier, or door if you will, that essentially prevents the molecules from this side going into this side. So all the six molecules, and each molecule carries a certain amount of energy, are essentially localized or concentrated on the left side of our container. Now, as soon as we open that door, what exactly happens? Well, before we open the door, what can we say about the energy in our system? So, how much energy is found on this side and how much energy is found on this side? Well, notice that we have six molecules on this side and each one of these molecules carries a certain amount of energy. So if the molecules are moving, they have a certain amount of kinetic energy and so forth. So each one of these molecules has a certain amount of energy and the total amount of energy on the left side of this container is equal to the sum of the individual energies of these molecules. So we have molecule one, molecule two, molecule three, molecule four, molecule five, and molecule six. So let's suppose that each one of these molecules carries the same amount of energy and each energy is equal to one unit. So we have six molecules. So we have, let's say, six units of energy on this side. Now, what about the amount of energy on this side? Well, we have no molecules on this side. So we have zero units of energy. And what that means is, all that energy is concentrated on the left side and no energy is found on the right side inside our system. Now, as soon as we remove this artificial barrier, as soon as we open, that, open up that door, what exactly will begin to take place? Well, what the second law of thermodynamics tells us is, whenever a system is given a chance to, or whenever something is given a chance to, it will always try to become as random as possible. And so what that means is these molecules will begin to travel to the other side. Now, a much better way of saying that is in the following way. Whenever energy is given the chance to, energy will tend to spread out and disperse along the entire space in which that energy is found in. Now, in this particular case, because we had the barrier, energy could not have moved to this side because of that barrier. But as soon as we remove that, the molecules tend to move to the other side, and as the molecules move, they also carry that energy. And mathematically, the most probable case is the case when we have three molecules on this side and three molecules on the other side. This is the state that has the highest entropy because it's the most probable state. And notice in this case, we have three units of energy on this side because we have three molecules and we have three units of energy on the other side. And so what happened is, in this case, all that energy was localized on the left side, but now the energy has equally dispersed so that we have an equal amount of energy on this side and an equal amount of energy on this side. So basically what the second law of thermodynamics tells us is when energy is given the chance to, it will disperse throughout all the space in which it actually exists. And what we can say is we can say that energy always travels from a high amount to a low amount. So we have a low amount here, a high amount here. Energy will tend to move this way, right, from a high amount to a low amount until we reach thermal equilibrium, until the two sides have an equal amount of energy. And this describes the highest entropy, the highest mathematic, uh, mathematical probability of our system. Now, for every physical and for every biological reaction, these two thermodynamical laws must be obeyed.
Now, we can even use these laws to explain many different reactions and phenomena that exist in biochemistry. For example, we can use the second law of thermodynamics to basically explain the hydrophobic effect. So let's suppose we have a beaker of pure water. So inside the beaker, all we have are these water molecules that are moving about and which are interacting with other water molecules via hydrogen bonds. Now let's suppose we take two nonpolar molecules and place them into our beaker. What will happen initially? Well, as soon as we place them into our beaker, all these water molecules that were eventually moving around randomly and rapidly, some of these water molecules will surround our nonpolar molecules. And when they surround the nonpolar molecules, they essentially are trapped. They become trapped to the nonpolar molecule. And these water molecules can no longer move about as frequently and randomly as before. So when the two nonpolar molecules in solution do not interact with one another, we see that we have many of these water molecules found around the nonpolar surface. And this basically decreases and limits the freedom of movement of the water molecule. And this is not a favorable event. This is not a favorable reaction because the entropy basically decreases compared to when these two nonpolar molecules were not in our solution. Now, what will happen is because of the second law of thermodynamics, because when given a chance to, we want to increase the amount of entropy of our system and our universe in general, we have the hydrophobic effect take place. And these nonpolar molecules will tend to aggregate because by aggregating, by combining, we decrease the amount of water molecules that are found around the surface because we decrease the, uh, the surface to volume ratio. And so what that means is in this case, we had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 water molecules that were trapped, but now because of the interaction between the two nonpolar molecules, we only have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 water molecules, and the other set of molecules have now moved away and now are moving randomly inside that water solution. And this is in accordance with the law of entropy, the second law of thermodynamics. So if the two nonpolar molecules come together via the hydrophobic interactions, they release many of the water molecules that were trapped before into the solution to interact with other water molecules and that forms uh, intermolecular bonds we call hydrogen bonds. Now this is in accordance with the second law of thermodynamics because the H2O molecules are more disordered than before. So in this particular case, they had a much greater order because they were surrounding those nonpolar molecules. But in this case, because some of those water molecules left, they are now moving about randomly and rapidly. And so the amount of entropy in our system basically increased. So we see that we can explain the hydrophobic effect by using the second law of thermodynamics. And in the same exact way, we can explain all the different types of reactions that take place in biochemistry by using the laws of thermodynamics. That is, these reactions in biology must obey these laws of thermodynamics.